you'll open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 15. Revelation, the 15th chapter, verse 2. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast. And they sang the song of Moses and the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. I want to be standing on that sea of glass, don't you? I want to be seeing Jesus sitting on his throne. I want to sing that song of Moses and the Lamb. I think if there's any one single word that expresses the desire of our hearts as we study the book of Revelation, or in any matter for that matter, that word would be victory. We want to be victorious, don't we? We want to be successful in life. We want to be successful for Jesus. We want to be successful not only in our Christian walk, but in our business life, our careers. We want to be successful in our homes, our families, our marriages. We want to be successful parents. We want to be successful people. I have never, ever met anyone who said, I want to be a failure. Have you? We all want to be victorious. We all want to overcome. The word overcome is found over and over again in the letters to the seven churches. To him who overcomes, Jesus promises. We want to be overcomers. We want to be successful. But I've discovered that there are many Christians living under a cloud of doubt, haunted by the fear of failure, discouraged because their lives just don't seem to be measuring up to the lofty standard of the Bible. And what a pity, because the laws for successful Christian living are so clear in the Scripture. Sometimes I think we make Christianity be so complicated that too many people just get discouraged and give up. On the other hand, there are those who reduce it to some meaningless simplicity to where there's no difference between a Christian or anyone else. But I believe that a little lady who stood up at church one night at prayer meeting to give her testimony hit the bullseye. She said, her language wasn't as polished as it could have been, but her message was right on, I ain't what I ought to be, and I Ain't what I'm going to be, but praise God, anyhow, I ain't what I was. <laughs> and I think she captured the essence of successful Christian living, recognizing our lives are not all that they ought to be, and exercising a bold determination to do better, praising God all the way for the victories that he's given us. But as I already mentioned, most are just the opposite, frustrated and discouraged with their Christian life. But God's promises, and I'm going to read a promise to you this morning that just lifts us up beyond human comprehension. It is so awesome and so powerful. In verse 3 first of 2 Peter chapter 1, his divine power has given us everything we need for life. His divine power gives us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory. And through these he has given us his very great and precious promises that through them you, and here's the part, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruptions in the world caused by evil desires. 
So the promise is that we can participate in God's divine nature, and when we do, he empowers us to escape the corruptions of the world, to be successful, to be victorious in Jesus Christ. Three laws for successful Christian living. What is the first law? Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not know what sin was except through the law. Now, which law is Paul speaking of here? Watch. I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. So the first law that Paul mentions is the Ten Commandment law, the one that says, thou shalt not covet. That's the first law. And we're going to discover that's the law that Paul wants to keep. He wants to be obedient to God's Ten Commandment law. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is not sin. In fact, he said in verse 12, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Nothing wrong with God's law. God's law is holy. It is righteous. It is good. He wants to be obedient to God's law. But we discover the real problem in verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual. Get that. God's Ten Commandment law is spiritual. The problem is not with the law. What's the problem? The law is spiritual, Paul said, but I am unspiritual. What? How can Paul, the apostle, say, I am unspiritual, the law is spiritual? How can he say, I am unspiritual? In fact, he goes on, it gets worse. I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree. The law is good, the problem is me. The law is spiritual, I'm unspiritual. How can Paul the apostle say, I am unspiritual? This has troubled some people so much that they came to the conclusion, well, that was Paul before he was converted. After he got converted, then he could never say, I am unspiritual. But the problem is, Paul, writing in his letter to the church at Rome, said, we know the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Was he telling the truth? At the time that he wrote his letter to Rome, he was the Apostle Paul, and he said, I, the Apostle Paul, am unspiritual. He didn't say, I was unspiritual, but I am unspiritual. The law is spiritual. The problem isn't the law. The problem is me. I have been sold as a slave to sin. He didn't say, I sold myself as a slave to sin. No, I have been sold as a slave to sin. We all have this battle with sin to fight the same battle that Paul fought. If I do what I do not want to do, I agree. The law is God. I don't know what I do. I don't even understand myself. The good that I want to do, I don't do. The evil I don't want to do, that's what I wind up doing. Oh, what am I going to do? <laughs> you ever felt like that? Reminds me of a little girl who got caught with her hand in the cookie jar. Mom comes in the kitchen. Oh, oh. Mom scolds her a little bit. Don't you ever do that again? I promise, Mommy, I won't ever do it again. The next day, Mom comes in the kitchen and pshh, that hand's in the cookie jar again. And she bursts into tears. And she says, but Mama... I don't always want to do what I want to do. <laughs> and I think that's kind of what Paul is saying here. And I've got a suspicion that every single one of us goes through that sometimes. I don't want to do what I want to do. There's a piece of me that wants to be obedient to the law of God, but there's another piece of me that every time I try, I wind up falling far and miserably short from the lofty standard that Jesus himself set for us. So what's the problem? Second law, verse 21. Now I find this law at work. 
when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. Now that's how you can know that this is Paul the apostle writing and he's not talking about himself before he was converted. That's impossible because he says, in my inner being I delight in God's law. And an unconverted man cannot say, in my inner being I delight in God's law. No way, impossible, because chapter 8, verse 7, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So this is not a sinful mind. This is not an unconverted person. This is Paul the Christian, Paul the apostle. In my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. So the Bible is telling us that there are two laws, God's law, that's the one that he wants to keep, and then there's the law of sin that's holding him down, preventing him from being obedient to the law of God, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin. He wants to obey, but the law of sin is holding him back. What a wretched man I am, verse 24, who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the same breath, what a wretched man I am. The good that I want to do, I can't do. The evil I don't want to do, that's what I wind up doing. Oh, what a wretched man I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow. Is he describing life as we know it today or not? That's the battle for the mind. Watch. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law. But in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Two laws. God's law. Spiritual, that he wants to keep. The law of sin. Preventing him, holding him down. Preventing him from keeping the law of God. Aren't you glad that Paul didn't finish his letter to the church at Rome? with chapter 7 but he gives us a solution to the problem in chapter 8 therefore verse 1 there is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus why not because through the Christ Jesus the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death the law of the spirit of life sets me free from the law of sin and death. It does not, notice, it does not set me free from the law of God. No, it sets me free from the law of sin that is preventing me from obeying the law of God in order that, verse 4, the righteous requirements of the law of God might be met in us. So he sets us free from the law of sin so that we can be obedient to the law of God. He doesn't set us free from the law of God. Don't let anyone tell you that the cross sets us free from the law of God. It sets us free from the condemnation of the law. It sets us free from the law of sin so that by the law of the Spirit we can become obedient to the law of God. Now we have to understand a couple of things before we go any further. And that is that Romans 7 and 8 are not instructions on how to get saved. Paul devoted the entire first six chapters of Romans on the fact that by the gospel we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by works, but it's a gift of God. Amen. Romans 1 through 6 define the gospel as salvation by grace through faith in him. But now when we get to Romans 8, and 7 and 8, he's talking about not how to get saved, but how do we live our lives after we have been saved. We're still living in a world of sin. We're still influenced by myriads and myriads of powers trying to lead us down the wrong pathway. So how can we be victorious in the midst of all of that? 
So let's not confuse the two. Three laws. The first law, God's law. That's the one that he wants to keep. The second law, the law of sin and death. Holding him down, preventing him and us from obeying the law of God that we desire deep down in our hearts to do. But the third law, praise the Lord, helps us to overcome the law of sin so that we can obey the law of God. And that's how the three laws for successful Christian living work in our lives. Well, how do we put the law of the spirit of life to work for us? That's the real question. How do we get the law of the spirit of life to empower us to live a victorious, powerful, successful life? Well, I'm going to show you how to do that. But first, it's quiz time. It's quiz time. So I want everybody to answer together now. We have just learned three spiritual laws for successful Christian living. The first one is the law of God, the Ten Commandments. Good. See if you can do better on the second one. That was a little weak. See if you can do better. The law that prevents us from obeying the law of God, holding us down, is the law of sin and death. Okay, now, since you did that one louder than the other, you really need to be louder than sin on this last one, right? So... The law that enables us to overcome the law of sin, to be obedient to the law of God, is the law of the... Come on, you can do better. Spirit of life. Spirit of life overcomes the law of sin, enables us to be obedient to the law of God, not in order to be saved, but because we have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So you got it? All right, now... I want to illustrate how this works in the world of nature because nature gives us good examples of the gospel. When I was a little boy growing up in Louisiana, every summer my grandpa would rent a camp out on the Gulf. Now down there, a camp is a little different from what you think of up here. A camp out on the Gulf was a cab, a big house built on pilings out over the water. And there'd be a long walkway up here, like going out to the house, built over the water. I can remember looking through the cracks in my bedroom and seeing the water down there. I loved going to the beach. My favorite thing was to get out there in that hot sun and white burning sand crystal clear water before Katrina messed it all up and just letting the waves splash up on me and watching the big brown pelican stretch out his wings and just soar so effortlessly through the air. I love brown pelicans. That's my favorite bird. That's why I got one sitting right here on my desk. See him? Isn't he cute? Big brown pelican, just soaring through the air, hardly moving a feather. I wanted deep down in my heart, oh, I wanted to fly like the brown pelican. If I could just fly like that. But I, I could have stood on the shore in the sand and the sun and the water and flapped my arms until they fell off and I'm not going to get off the ground because the law of gravity is holding me down and it prevents me from doing what deep down in my heart I want to do and that's fly like the brown pelican. The law of gravity is holding me down. But there's a third law, the law of flight. It's called Bernoulli's theory. And the law of flight, or Bernoulli's theory, is that when air moves across a surface, it reduces the pressure that it exerts on that surface. And the faster the air goes, the lower the pressure it exerts on that surface. 
Now, an airplane wing is designed in such a way as to take advantage of Bernoulli's theory. The airplane wing is curved on the top. I don't know if you ever noticed that. And it's flat across the bottom. So that means that as it moves through the air, the air going over the top of the wing has to travel a greater distance than the air going straight across the bottom. But it does it in the same time, so the air across the top has to go faster than the air across the bottom. And the plane moves through the air fast enough, the air across the top is so much less pressure than the air across the bottom, it can cause the plane to fly. I remember first time I walked out to the giant B-52 bomber. There it was, my first flight. Boy, the closer we got to that airplane, the bigger it looked. 500 plus thousand pounds loaded. And the closer we got, the bigger it looked, the smaller those eight engines looked. And I started to think, no way. That giant bird is never going to get off the ground. But we did all of our pre-flight checklists, jumped into the plane, got clearance to start the engines, and began taxiing out to the end of the runway. Big, heavy airplane. Finally, we got clearance from the tower to take off. Taxied out into position, and all eight throttles, full forward, loud roar. And that big plane began to just barely inch down the runway, and I knew we would never get off the ground. But it started gathering speed faster and faster. And the air flowing over the top was going faster than the air across the bottom. And we got to a certain speed that the air over the top was so fast, the pressure it exerted on top of the wing was so much lower than the pressure the air under the wing was exerting that 500,000 pounds of airplane and me lifted off the ground and finally I could soar with the pelicans even higher because the law of flight enabled me to overcome the law of sin and death and to soar in fulfillment of the desire deep in my heart. And that's the way it is with God. We want to obey the law, but sin holds us down. The law of the spirit of life enables me to overcome the law of sin and soar in obedience to the law of God. Not in order to be saved. No, but because he saved me by grace through faith in Jesus Christ to do good works that he prepared in advance for us to do. So how do we put it to work for us? How do we get that law of the spirit of life to work? There are two steps. The first step is your part. The second step God's part. You do yours, and God will do his. So what is our part? I'm going to read it to you in Romans 8, verse 5, and see if this phrase doesn't just jump off the pages to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. See if you pick it up. The key to the law of the spirit of life. Now, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Did you get it? What's the key? Set your mind. The mind set on the Spirit is going to do the things of the Spirit. The mind set on the sinful nature is going to do the things of the sinful nature. Set your mind. That's your part. You do your part, God will do his. What is your part? Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. I call it mental 
discipline. Mental discipline. Not to be confused with some of the, the classics. They're old, but they're still taught in the basis for success teaching today. Some of the old classics. Norman Vincent Peale, The Power of Positive Thinking. Maxwell Maltz, Psycho-Cybernetics, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. These are old classic books, but the basic principles in there are still valid today. The problem is that they all miss a very important key point. And I used to teach success seminars and sales training seminars based on those principles. But once I became a Christian, I discovered that all of those principles worth anything at all were already in this book. You used to charge $600 for a seminar, and now you get it for free. The laws for successful. How do we get the law of the spirit of life to work? There are three steps, three verses. First one, I'm sure you know it by heart. Proverbs 23, verse 7. Whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, what? So is he. Whatever you think determines what you are. You are what you think about. Now that's something to think about, isn't it? Your thoughts determine what you are. That's the first step. The second step, in Luke 6, 45, Jesus said, the good man does good from the good stored up in his heart. The evil man does evil from the evil stored up in his heart. So not only do your thoughts determine who you are, but your thoughts determine what you do. Your behavior is controlled by the way that you think. That's what Jesus said. Can you trust him? The good man does good from the good stored up in his heart. How do you store up good in your heart? By thinking right. By thinking about the things of the Spirit. So your behavior determine, uh, your thoughts determine what you are. Your thoughts determine what you do. The third step in, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, is just common sense. If your thoughts determine what you are and your thoughts determine what you do, then in order to change what you do, in order to change your behavior, you simply need to change your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Romans 12. You see, it's all in the Bible. So your thoughts determine who you are. Your thoughts determine what you do. In order to change what you do, change your thoughts. Change your mind. And your behavior will follow. But it's not that easy. It's not as easy as it sounds. Why? Because we think in terms of thought patterns. And these thought patterns are called habits. Now, when I said habits, you probably thought bad, <laughs> right? <laughs> but a habit is bad only if it's a bad habit. <laughs> habits can be good. In fact, some tell us that as much as 90% is what we do on a daily basis is a result of habit, and I believe that. These habits are very, very powerful. And they're formed by the process of repetition. Thinking a certain way over and over again, and it becomes a habit. These habits are so powerful that it's difficult to change the way we think. But you can't change your behavior unless you change your thoughts. Let me give an illustration how habits are formed. How many of you know how to drive a car? Okay, a few. <laughs> Let me ask this one. How many of you know how to drive a stick shift. Now that's interesting. 
Every place I go, I find more people know how to drive a stick shift than know how to drive. <laughs> you explain that to me. Yeah, I drive stick shift. You know how to drive? <laughs> All right. Remember when you learned how to drive a stick shift? I remember. Boy, I sat in that car. My dad taught me how. And he had me going through a little list in my head of all the things I needed to do, make sure the brake was set, and then put that key in there. And I even had to think about which way, this way or that way. How's it go? I put the key in there. You know, I did everything. And then finally, gave it a little gas and turned the key and broom, started right up. Oh, man, I'm driving. And then I had to release the brake. The clutch in and let that clutch in and give the gas just at the right rate and the right point let out the clutch and you know what the first time I did that I just took off so smoothly do you believe that what happened jerk 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 <laughs> it quit on me I had to try it again jerk 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 Quit on me again. Jerk, 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 quit. Oh, I'm never going to get it. Jerk, 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 quit. Finally, it went jerk, 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 jerk. And it went on. Oh, I'm driving, I'm driving. I almost hit a tree. Got so excited. <laughs> you remember that? Do you remember the first time you stopped at a red light on a hill? <laughs> and there was a car behind you? <laughs> oh, man. But do you remember the last time that happened? Probably not. Why not? Because through the process of repetition, all those thoughts become established as patterns or habits. And the truth is, you probably barely remember driving to church this morning. You just jumped in your car. You didn't think about which way the key goes or which way to turn it or clutches or anything. You just jump in the car and go because it's a habit. And habits are good because it sets your mind free to do other things while you're driving, like watch for traffic. <laughs> so habits are good if they're good habits. And most of what we do is the result of a habit. And they're powerful. Let me show you how powerful they are. If you'll let me do a worldly illustration. I've tried to, pastor said it's okay, so I'll do it. I try to keep coming up with something better, but I can't. Let me tell you a little jingle. Pepsi Cola hits the spot. About four or five of you got it. Twelve full ounces, that's a, a lot. Yeah, a few more are getting on bandwagon here. Now, how did you know that? I mean, when you first heard that jingle on the radio, did you say, oh, man, that's cool? No, oh, they weren't saying cool back then. You said, oh, man, I like that. Oh, yeah, I really like it. I'm going to memorize it. I'm going to write it 150 times so I can get it perfect. Pepsi Cola hits the spot, 12 full ounces, that's a lot. Over and over and over again until, oh, I got it. Yes, I learned it. Is that what happened? Nope. What happened? You heard it over and over and over and over until it became established as a habit pattern, a thought pattern or habit. Now, oh, you're going to hate me for this. Do you know how long it's been since you've heard that on the radio? <laughs> well, let me just say it this way. Over 40 years, way over 40 years, you haven't heard that jingle way over 40 years. And yet now, I can still say Pepsi Cola hits the, and you instantly respond with spot. See, habits are very, very powerful creatures. And that's why it's not always so easy to change our behavior, because in order to change our behavior, we have to change the way we think. Now, there's one other thing that we need to understand before we actually apply these Bible texts and put them into practice in our lives. And that is that your brain has two halves to it. The left half and the right half. 
The left side of the brain is where we learn things and memorize things and store information and we think logically and sequentially and we work math problems and all, all of that is done on the left side of the brain. Language is stored on the left side of the brain. The right side of the brain is emotional for the most part. Now I realize for those of you that are experts in healthcare, I'm being oversimplifying a little bit just to keep it simple. But the right side of the brain is basically emotional. That's where we, our feelings are, are seated. Now, when we learn things, we put the information into the left side. The right side, through the process of repetition, picks it up and the right side automatically follows the instructions given to it. It's like a general and an army. The general looks at the whole situation with his staff and plans strategically what to do and where to strike and with how much. And then he issues the orders. He gives the orders to the army, the troops, and the troops carry out the orders. They don't modify it, they don't change it, they don't stop and think, well, this isn't a very good order, I think we'll do it this way instead of his way. No, if it's a good army, they're going to automatically obey the orders that they're given indiscriminately, just obey it. Now that's the way the brain works. The left brain is the general, the right brain, that's the troops. The left brain makes the decisions, the right brain can't do that. It just takes the orders from the left brain and automatically doesn't decide is this a good thing or a bad thing. It just does what it's told to do. So through the process of repetition, those orders become embedded in the right brain and they automatically function without you even thinking about it. It just happens. That's why it's so hard to change. We have to, through the process of repetition, establish a new habit that's stronger and more powerful than the one that's been in force for years and years. That's why it's so hard to change our behavior. I remember the first... You ever been to a country where they drive on the wrong side of the road? <laughs> Our son's in London, and we were over there visiting him a few years ago and uh, rented a car. And here we go, I'm driving down the wrong side of the road. We drive on the right side. They go on the wrong side, the left side. And so I'm driving along, and as long as I could think about it, you know, yeah, stay on the left side, stay on the left side, stay on the wrong side, you're okay. We did fine. But then we would start talking. And I'd look over there and say something to Dina, and she'd say something back, and I'd get all into the conversation. And before I know it, she's going, Jack, you're on the wrong side of the road. I'm looking up, oh yeah, get back over there on the wrong side. <laughs> you know, because I know what to do, but it isn't over here in my right brain yet to do it without me thinking about it. Now, if we're going to change our behavior, we're going to have to change those thought patterns. And those thought patterns are generally given to the right brain as orders in terms of images and pictures. The right brain processes pictures. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to say a word. Are you ready? Car. Now, what did you see? Did you see the letters C-A-R? Or did you see a picture of a car? You saw the picture of a car. Your car, maybe. Maybe one you wish was your car. But you saw the picture of a car. See, our instructions are given to the right brain in terms of images and pictures. So that means that if you're a student and you see yourself as a failure, then you're given instructions to your right brain to watch TV the night before the exam instead of study. You're going to fail. If you see yourself successful, then you're given instructions to succeed. If you see yourself as a successful Christian, soaring in obedience to God, then that's what you're going to do. 
But if you see yourself as a failure, that's what you're going to do. And while we're talking about this, parents, I'll have to confess that there are times when I just cringe when I see the way some parents talk to their children. They may be getting into a little mischief. Who doesn't? And they'll say something like, you are so bad. You're going to wind up in jail. What kind of image are they forming in the minds of their child? You are just worse than a bunch of monkeys around here. And they wonder, why does my son act like a monkey? Because they've been told over and over again that that's what they are, and that's the image they have, and they're going to do it. So parents, be careful what you say to the little ones. Does this really work? Folks, it does. God made us that way. That's how he made our brain to work. Let me prove it to you. Why don't you sit with your feet flat on the ground? Put your feet down, hands in your lap. Relax, but don't close your eyes. Or close your eyes, but don't sleep. Let's do it that way. Close your eyes. If you sleep, it won't work. This ain't going to hurt. All I want you to do is just picture in your mind a bright yellow lemon. Crystal clear. Get it sharp focus. Turn it around so you can see the green letters, sun kissed, written on it. You see the dimples in the skin, the little stem on the end. Lemon. Get it in focus. Now, picture a razor-sharp knife slicing through the lemon. Juice explodes all across the blade. It is so juicy. Picture yourself picking up half of that lemon and squeezing it over your outstretched tongue. Give it a good squeeze. Scree drip, 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 drip. Ooh, wow, it is so sour. <laughs> squeeze it again. Get some more. Get a mouthful. Pick up the other half. Squeeze it over your tongue. Swallow it. Get another big mouthful. Oh, it is so sour. Okay, you can open your eyes. How many of you noticed your mouth began to water? <laughs> Did it? Did you say mouth water? No. You put the image there, and your right brain took that image as an order, and your mouth began to water. It works. That's the way God made you. That's the way he made your brain to function. And so that's why he said you need to set your mind on the things of the Spirit, because that's giving your right brain instructions of what to do. People come to me and say, Pastor, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just can't grow spiritually. I always say, well, what do you watch on TV? What kind of books you read? You see, you can't fix your mind on the filth and the cesspools of this old world and expect to soar in obedience to God. Amen. In the computer industry, they have a formula. It's called GIGO. G-I-G-O. Garbage in, garbage out. You cannot program a bunch of errors into a computer and expect to get the right answer. You can't take the picture of a pile of sewerage and expect it to come out looking like a rose, unless you have Photoshop. <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? What do you read? What do you watch? Fix your mind on the things of the Spirit, and that's what you're going to do. That's the law of life. That's the way God made you. In fact, why do you think Paul said in Philippians 4th chapter, 8th verse, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, whatever is pure, lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What a God. He tells us how to think, and then he tells, me what, tells us what we should be thinking about. That verse should be printed out in big letters and pasted on the top of your television set. Is it noble? Is it pure? Is it trustworthy? Is it right? Is it lovely? Is it admirable? If it is, okay. If it's not, don't watch it. You can't program all that garbage into your mind and expect to be obedient, empowered by the law of the spirit of life. 
we have to die to sin. Discipline, mental discipline must be total. We need to die, Paul said. We die to sin. Dead people don't respond to anything. And that's the way we need to be. We need to be dead to the temptations of sin. We die. We don't respond. Sometimes people ask me, Pastor, I don't know what's wrong with me. I keep getting all these bad thoughts in my mind all the time. And I surprise them. I say, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with bad thoughts coming into your mind. It's called temptation. It only becomes wrong when you choose to keep those bad thoughts there. We need to put them out of our minds. We live in a world of sin. We're going to see things all around that are bad. That's temptation. But when we get a bad thought, we need to put it out. I'm going to tell you the secret of the banana tree. Now, you don't know that up here because you don't have banana trees. So let me tell you about it. We bought a house when we lived down in South Texas. We bought a house that had banana trees. And so I as a good banana plantation owner. Had a big plantation. It was about this big. I bought a machete because you might not know it, but banana trees make one bunch of bananas and they die. They're finished. But they send up little shoots, make new banana trees. Now the problem is that one tree sends up a lot of shoots. And if you just let these things grow, they get so thick that you, you, they'll choke each other out and they'll all die. So you have to weed out your banana trees. Well, I got there, got my machete, and my two little guys helping me, and I chopped through that first banana tree. It was about that big around. And they're heavy. And I had to drag that banana tree down to the back of our lot big ditch back there. My two guys were going to help me. They rode on the leaves while I pulled it. <laughs> and I got that tree back here. I'm tired, man. It's heavy. But there were more. So, wow, I'll cut down another one and drag that. Oh, man, I'm getting tired. Only two. I have a lot more to do, and I'm doing another one. I don't know if I can do this one or not. Finally, I make it to the back. I come back thinking, you know, maybe I've done enough for today. And then all of a sudden, aha, I saw it. A banana tree, that big. So I took my machete and I went, whoosh, one flick of the wrist. And it was gone. Bent down, picked it up, put it in my pocket. Found another one, whoosh, picked it up, put it in my pocket. Another one, whoosh, 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 put them in my pocket. Pretty soon, my pockets were full of banana trees. So I just walked to the back of the lot, empty my pockets. See, it's a lot easier to get them when they're that big than when they're full grown. And so the secret is, when a bad thought comes into your mind, put it out immediately. Put it out. Don't let it take root. Don't let it get to be a big banana tree. Put it out. Learn how to recognize the bad thoughts by studying your Bible, studying the Word of God. And then when a bad thought comes in, immediately recognize it. Put it out. That's the secret of the banana tree. Amen. Don't let them take root and they'll never result in action. Amen. It'll change your life. Mental discipline. A man had learned... One night at Revelation now that his body was the temple of the Holy Spirit and he, he was a smoker. He says, that's it. I don't, want to, I don't want to put anything in my body that defiles it. I want to keep healthy and strong so I can understand God and what he's trying to say to me. He was a farmer in Oklahoma driving around that big tractor around the field that day. He said, that's it. I'm going to quit smoking. So he takes his cigarettes out of his pocket and throws them over his shoulder and then turned around to see where they hid in the dirt. So he's driving around. He said, I wonder how long I'm going to be able to go. And he goes around the field. Oh, man, I could just, one more cigarette. <laughs> it would just taste so good if I could have one more. And he gets back to that spot where he threw him out. 
And he got off the tractor, picked up the cigarettes, and he started smoking again. And he's thinking, good night, what's wrong with me? I've gone longer than that without smoking, not even trying to quit. So he's disgusted with himself. He throws them down and buries them in the dirt. He gets on the tractor, goes round and round the field. Sun's getting ready to set, pulls into the barn and goes to that, his house. And there's that big farm dinner his wife has spread out on the table for him. Oh, wow, it was so good. His tummy is so full. Before he knows it, he's digging around in his shirt pocket. No cigarettes. But he wants a cigarette. So he gets up and he goes over to the drawer where he keeps them. No cigarettes. His wife got rid of them all. He goes running around looking in all the ashtrays. Just a butt. That's all I want, a butt. She emptied them all and threw it all out. But he did find a flashlight. So he goes out in the field with a flashlight, looking around in the dirt, kicking the clods around until finally he found them. Sat out there on the dirt clod, smoked three cigarettes in a row. Then he said, that's it. That's it. I'm going to quit smoking, and I am not even going to think about it anymore. And as far as I know, that was the last cigarette he ever smoked. Mental discipline. Fix your mind on the things of the Spirit. You do your part, and then God will do his part. But what's God's part? Verse 9, Romans 8, You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. Verse 11, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. And if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is willing to live in you and empower you to live and break the habits that enslave and destroy the mind and the body. You can be free. You can be successful. But it's the law of the Spirit of life that enables God's Spirit to work in us and to empower us to break those shackles and to be free. We do our part, mental discipline, fix your mind on the Spirit, and God will do His part, and you can live victoriously for Christ. So why do I have to do my part first? Why don't God do His first? It'd be a lot easier. Well, God never forces. The beast uses force, but not God. And we demonstrate to God that we really want him to change us by fixing our mind on the things of God. If we say, oh God, I want to be a Christian, I want to be saved, but we keep focusing our attention, watching pornography on the internet and watching all the bad things, reading the bad, we're really saying, God, I don't really want to change. We signal the change by fixing our mind on the things of the Spirit. You do your part, God does his, and this closing verse is so powerful. I could have read it at the beginning, and it would have been the whole message. So why didn't you do that? Well, I have more to say. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We who with unveiled faces all behold the Lord's glory of being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. By beholding him, we become transformed into his likeness. Amen. Fix your minds on Jesus, and you will do the things of the Spirit. A friend of mine who does what we do, an evangelist, tells the story. He didn't have the advantage, I don't know if it was an advantage or not, the opportunity to be in the military and to fly military jets. And he loved flying, though. And all his life he wanted to fly. This was way back in the Vietnam War when the F-4 Phantom Jet was it. I mean, that was it. Everybody wanted to fly the F-4 Phantom. Oh, he would love to have had a ride on a Phantom jet, but he wasn't in the military. No hope. Well, one day he was doing a seminar like this, and he accidentally let it slip out that he wished he could get a ride on a F-4 Phantom jet. Afterwards, a man came up to him. He says, you really want to ride a Phantom? He said, yeah. He says, I'm a flight instructor over at the air base. I can get you a ride. Oh, man. He couldn't believe it. So he went over and did a little bit of quick emergency training and 
preparation. And finally, the, the day came for him to arrive, and he went over there, and they had him fixed up in, a, in his flight suit and a helmet, oxygen mask. Oh, wow, fighter pilot. You know, he's going to ride in that Phantom. So he climbed in the jet, and the pilot instructed him, I have two rules for you while we're flying. Number one, the microphones are voice activated. Don't you say a word. I don't care what's happening. Don't say a word. Oh, I won't talk. I won't talk. I promise you. Number two, see that stick between your knees? Don't even think about touching it. That's for me. Don't touch it. I won't touch it. I won't touch it. I promise. Okay, so they take off. And it happened to be a formation flight. There's another aircraft off on the right. He was lead, and they were flying. And my friend in the back noticed, hey, boy, that pilot's always looking out the side window instead of the front. He's looking at the wingtip of the lead aircraft. And every time they climbed, we climbed, and they dove, and we dove, and they did a split S, and we did a split S, and everything they did, we did. And the pilot's just looking at the wingtip on the other airplane. Finally, they finished the flight, and they were getting ready to go back to land. The pilot's still looking out the side window. My friend's looking at the airbase. It's right there. And they're getting closer and closer, and the pilot's still looking out the side. And finally, he starts getting nervous. And he can't hold it in anymore. And he said, I know I'm not supposed to talk, but when are you going to look up? <laughs> the pilot looking out the side window, the wingtip of the other aircraft. He said, when our wheels touch the ground, be quiet. Now, he was probably being a macho pilot. I doubt if he landed it looking out the side of the window. But folks, we're headed into the kingdom. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the left. Don't look behind. Just look straight ahead at Jesus. And don't move your eyes until your wheels touch the ground.